Second verses 13 to 15. And this is after Paul has dealt with explaining who the man of sin was to these folks at the church in Thessalonica. Verses 13 to 15, chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians. I'd like to hear those pages turn. And remember, if you if you don't know the Bible very well, folks, it's not a crime. You know, you can your table of content. You can find the book just by going there. It even tells you what page number it's on. Yeah. All right, beginning with verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. That's the Lord to bless our time. Father, thank you for this passage. Help us to understand it. But Father, help us to appreciate more when we leave this place today what you have done for us. Bless our time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, for the last two weeks, we considered the man of sin that's mentioned earlier in this passage. And we saw the Roman emperor, Nero, fits this description very well. And Paul ended up his remarks about the man of sin by describing the ones who would be misled by the man of sin. Notice again how Paul describes him, and that's in the verses previous to verse 13. He described them as foolish. They would be deceived. They would not receive the love of the truth. They would believe the lie, and they had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, you may think when you read that 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 describes some politicians today. And to some extent, it does. It also describes those today who have pleasure in unrighteousness. They're everywhere, and they want you to approve of their evil deeds. I could spend the rest of my time explaining what that is. We must resist them and the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. But what was it that separated or separates us from them? And it's a word in this text that describes that. And that's the word election. Now I know when you hear election, you think of in November we're going to the polls and we're going to vote for this, that, or the other. And that's what we will do. But when we see that word in Scripture, Paul thanks God for the election of the church at Thessalonica. And when you hear that word, sometimes you might relate that to Calvinism. And it is, but folks, it's a biblical doctrine. It is a clear biblical doctrine. The word used here instead of election is the word chose. We often talk of us choosing God, but the idea is that God first chose us. And Paul wants this church to know and understand his language and contrast them being chosen with those who were deceived into believing a lie, or the lie. And what was that lie, you ask? The lie consisted of emperor worship as if he was a god. Don't ever do that to another human being. It's okay to appreciate someone. It's okay to love them. But do not worship them. Worship is reserved only for God. To worship anything or anyone other than God the scripture says is sin. Now let's consider Paul's doctrine of election as it appears here in this text and I pray we'll come away appreciating what God has done for us more than we ever have before. Six results and I will go through them quickly that stem from our election which will make us appreciate what he's done for us. Look at the first result. You see it in verse 13, the first part. Election is a cause for thanksgiving. <coughs> Paul says we are bound. He begins by saying he and his companion are bound, are obligated to thank God. This is very similar to his 
statement or his first Thanksgiving statement in chapter 1, verse 3 of this second letter. Here Paul thanked God for there. Paul thanked God for the church and how they were growing in Christ. But here Paul thanks God for electing them or choosing them to salvation. You say, well, why would Paul do that? That's a good question. Well, why did God choose anyone? That's a good question too. In Ephesians 1, verse 4, the apostle says, Just as He, God, chose us in Him, Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him. The New American Standard goes on and says, In love He predestined us. And I know people sometimes get scared of the word predestination, as if we have nothing to do with anything. That's not true, and we'll talk about that. All believers, were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's what Ephesians 1, 4 says. But all believers were chosen by God. That's the point that the apostle is making. God chose us. We didn't choose him. It's like a little boy that was adopted by a family and when interviewed by a local TV station a couple of years after he was uh, adopted, they asked him how all that happened. He said, well, I was sitting in the orphanage and these people came by and looked at me, and I looked at them, and I liked them, so I picked them. <laughs> well, we know that's not how it happened, but the point is, they got together, and that's all that matters. In 1 Peter 1, verse 2, Peter says this, and he uses the word elect, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you, and peace be multiplied. Now, when we look at that, we might want to focus on those, what we might call important words, elect or foreknowledge. But I want to draw your attention to the word according. It often denotes intensity. Do you realize that when God chose you, it was an intense thing for Him to do that? Intent. He examined everything there is to know about you. Now, he didn't do that so he could choose you. He did that because he chose you. We ought to thank God for your election and mine. Amen. Number two, election is a result of God's love. You see that in the second part of chapter 13, verse 13. Two things stand out in this phrase. Number one, they were Paul's brothers and sisters. He calls them brethren. Now, if you have the New English translation of the Bible, and I don't know how many people have that, but it's a good translation, it will translate the word brethren, brothers and sisters, because it's not talking to just men. It's talking about women also. You see, the new birth puts us in the same family. Paul calls it adoption. We're adopted into the family of God. You say, well, I've never been adopted. If you're a child of God, you have. It doesn't mean that you knew that. You ought to know it. The second thing, they were loved by the Lord. That's what he says right here. Beloved by the Lord. I don't see how you can misunderstand that. It was love that led God to elect them. It's not based on what we could do or what we could be. It's based on God. He doesn't look at us and say, well, Keith Jones will be a pastor, so I'll pick him. No. He says, I'm going to pick him so he can become a pastor. That's the idea. It's not based on anything in us. And it stems from the love of God, which I will tell you is a particular love. God does not love everybody the same. We have this idea, and we've heard it, and it's all based on John 3.16, which does not say that, that God loves everybody because God loves so loved the world. Is that so? Does the Scripture interpret itself? Yes, it does. In Psalm 5 and Psalm 7, the Scripture says that God hates wicked people. You can't love them and hate them at the same time. God chooses those whom, those whom he loves. And as I mentioned, he doesn't choose everyone. And he certainly does not love everyone the same. 
that's where the word predestination often scares people because they think, well, it takes everything out of my hand. Well, when it comes to your salvation, you don't want it to be in your hand. <clears throat> but why would it scare anyone? You can go back to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, and read it. In love, God predestined. It is an act of love. You say, well, why is it such a scary word? This is why. If God did not predestine you to be saved, you would not. You can say amen or you can think about it. You say, so it's not up to me. Never has been, never will. As I mentioned, when we get to heaven, if there's a spotlight, it's not going to be on you and me. It's going to be on Christ. Amen. There's no reason. Amen. There's no reason for us to brag. Paul talks about that, doesn't he? He said, don't brag. You have nothing to brag about. Everything you have was given to you. But there's a number three. Election is from the beginning. You see that in the third part of verse 13. <clears throat> from the beginning of what, you might ask? Well, that's a good question. According to Ephesians chapter 1, because Scripture interprets Scripture, we were elected from before the foundation of the world. What does John 1, 1 say? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What was the Word doing? Now, we read on down in John chapter 1, we find out that the Word was Jesus Himself. So you've got the Father and the Son, and of course you can't take the Spirit out of that equation because he is coexistent, co-eternal, and just co-everything with God. He is God. What were they doing in John chapter 1? It doesn't tell us, does it? We can surmise from the rest of Scripture that they were planning the creation of the world, the universe, and everything that exists. But that's not all. They were also electing who was to be saved. Oh, but I don't like that. That, that. that takes it out of my hand. Be glad it takes it out of your hands. The best place you could ever be is in the hands of God. Amen. Amen. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that election is from the beginning? That's a good question too. Well, you see, when did God create this person we call Satan. He, by the way, he is a created being. He is not God. He's not on par with God. He's not equal to God. He is inferior to God because he's a created being. And God created him. You say, the, the God created the devil? God created all things. Especially the devil. You say, why did he do that? Well, start in Genesis 1-1 and read all the way to the end. You'll figure it out. But you see, the devil did not exist before the foundation of the world. We read in Job where the morning stars sang together on the day that God began to put the universe together. Who were the morning stars? The angels. Of which Satan was one of them. So, he wasn't in on this threesome of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit when they chose who would be saved. He wasn't there. He doesn't know who is and who isn't. As a matter of fact, Paul talks about that in his first letter to the church at Corinth, chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Listen to what he says. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now you read that and you think, well, that's talking about Pilate and Caiaphas. And no. No. Not the rulers of the earth. Uh-uh. This is the rulers of the powers of the air. The enemy. They didn't know who Jesus was was when they put him in the tomb they said they were high-fiving one another we have won and the devil was rejoicing 
three days later, the rejoicing stopped. Amen. I bought my my wife a shirt when we were when I, I went with Jesse a couple of years back and some of the youth to uh, Wild Adventures. Is that the name of it up there? And uh, I found out then that I was too old to ride some of those rides. <laughs> but anyway, I bought her a shirt because I said this fits her to a T. And it says, I want to be the kind of woman that when my boots hit the floor in the morning, the devil says, oh no, she's up. <laughs> <laughs> See, he doesn't know everything. He didn't know when the Holy Spirit was drawing you to Christ. He didn't know that you were going to be saved. He didn't know that. Makes you appreciate it a little bit more, doesn't it? Thank God the devil doesn't know everything. Thank God he's not on par with the creator of all things. He, God and the devil are not playing a chess match in heaven. Because if they were, it would be checkmate already. But let's go on. There's number four. Election consists of calling. You see that in the first part of verse 14. This calling has two parts. Paul mentions it right here. It has a divine part. He calls it sanctification of the Spirit. What does that mean? That means sometime in time, the Holy Spirit came on you. You might not have even understood what was going on. He came on you and He set you apart for salvation. And when He set you apart for salvation, you will be saved. That's all there is to it. We and they, those in the church at Thessalonica, were set apart for salvation by the Spirit of God. That is His job. I don't know about you, I am so glad He did that. I remember when he did. There's a divine part, but there's also a human part. And notice what Paul says. Belief in the truth. That's our part. What are we supposed to do? We are to believe the gospel. We are to repent of our sins and believe the gospel. Those two things are universally understood scripture. You have to do that. Being born again gives us the ability to believe or have faith. Think about it. If Paul said in Romans 2, I'm not Romans 2, but Ephesians 2, that we were dead in trespasses and sin, what does that mean? We were dead. We were dead to the things of God. We did not understand the Scripture. We did not understand God. We didn't even understand why we were here. But, in verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, or writes, but God. <laughs> Those are good words. But God made us alive together with Christ. That's what he did. Then, when we were made alive, we could believe. And we did. And as I mentioned, not everyone is called. Matthew 22, verse 14 says, For many are called, but few are chosen. And I don't have time to get into this, but there is a general call to all men. But there is a special call to the elect. And even though we are called, we still have responsibility. You have responsibility. 2 Peter 1, verse 10, Therefore, brethren, the apostle writes, Be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never stump. How do you do that, Peter? <clears throat> Obedient to the Word of God. That's how you do it. <clears throat> At camp, one of the days, I gave a verse for the children to discuss as to what it meant. It was Matthew 11, verse 12. And it says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. What is that verse teaching? Well, we had an interesting discussion in our Bible time about that verse. Because many today think that the way to heaven is gentle, easy, and without difficulty. This verse says different. 
If you want to gain assurance of your salvation from the Bible, listen to what I'm about to say. You must work hard, for the devil is working against you as hard as he can. And don't think he's not working hard. He is. I explained to the children, if I had a huge rock up here that weighed 800 pounds, I said, maybe if all of us got together, we might be able to lift that. Maybe not. I said, it takes a great amount of force and power to lift a great rock. It takes a lot of force and power for you and me to make it to the celestial city. Just read the Pilgrim's Progress. You've read that, haven't you? Oh, shame on you. Beside the Bible, that's the number two best-selling book in existence. You ought to read it. Because once Pilgrim, or Christian as he comes to be called, is saved, the difficulty starts. You think that being saved solves all your problems. No, it brings a lot of things that you didn't even know existed. You got to work hard. You say, but I thought salvation was by grace. Salvation is by grace through faith. But after that, get ready to work. Number five, election results in glorification. You see that in the second part of verse 14. This phrase is not easy to understand because I'll give you an assignment if you would take it. Go home anytime this week and try to find out what glory means. You say, is it a noun or a verb? Yes. And it's an adjective. It's according to how it's used. This phrase is not easy to understand when we read it. Notice what the apostle says at the end of verse 14. For the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That to me is confusing. That's why we study. The New King James uses one word of. Some translations use two words. And when you put two of words in the sentence, it's going to get confusing. Well, what is the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ? Just to give you, well, just to give you some ideas. Is it His presence? Is it His being? We're told in Scripture that we will share in His glory. What does that mean? This could be in His glorification at the end of time. This could be our identity with Him as our King. This could be our reigning with Him in eternity. Which is it? Yes! Our glorification had to do with our final state in a glorified body. I'm so glad that God's going to give us a new glorified body for lots of reasons. One, have you ever been sick? Wasn't fun, was it? You've ever had the flu so that you had to sit on the toilet and hold a garbage can? Was it fun? I think you know the answer to that. How many of you in here have had a colonoscopy? <laughs> Woo, look at the hands. I see those hands. Was that fun? The funnest part about that for me was when they stuck the stuff in my arm and put me to sleep. Because you see, we will be like Jesus. We will have a body similar to His. That does not mean we will be divine. We're not going to become gods like the Mormons say. Oh no. We're not going to become gods. And we're not going to be like the Muslims and get our own planet somewhere. No, we will not, never be divine, but we will share in His glory. Amen. You say, well, doesn't the Old Testament say that God will not share His glory with anyone? Yeah, but read the context. He's not going to share His glory with another false god. No, no, no. Number six, election causes men to stand for the truth. And this is where we will finish, verse 15. Notice how he ends that section. Therefore, brethren, stand fast 
and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. If you're truly saved, you have a desire to stand for the truth. Now, having said that, people get the wrong idea and say, well, basically you're saying that if I'm truly saved, I must be a Republican. <laughs> no, but it helps. <clears throat> Paul gives two necessary results of election here. Number one, true believers will stand for the truth. Folks, this is part of the Christian life. If you don't know what the truth is, you need to be reading this book. Amen. That's truth. That's absolute truth. We stand for and on what God has said. That means when we have a discussion with someone who's confused about their gender, that we can go to Genesis chapter 2 and show them that God made male and female and there's nothing in between or outside of that. There isn't. There's nothing there. Stand for the truth. One thing I appreciate about Bodie Balkum and his some some people try to get him uh, intertwined in a political conversation, and you know what he does? We preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, telling people to repent and believe the gospel. That's what we do. We're not going to get caught up in political things. It's not worth it. But the second thing that Paul said, true believers will follow the word of God. We study to know what to do. We study to know how to do it. Because God never tells us anything in His Word. He doesn't tell us how to do it. Remember, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. What did He do? Well, give me a pen and paper and I'll write down an outline and you follow that. Now, He didn't do that, did He? He said, pray like this. And every time before we went on the football field when I was in high school, we quoted the Lord's Prayer. I can still quote it. But I think you know what I'm talking about. And Jesus didn't say, pray this prayer. Did he? He said, pray like this. Use that idea. We study to know what to do. We study to know how to do it. And notice the source of the information that Paul lists here. Number one is by oral teaching. That's what you're sitting under right now. Oral teaching. You have your Bible open and you're hearing me do my very best to explain what this says. That's exposition. Explaining what Scripture said. Remember when Jesus met those two disciples after his resurrection on the road to Emmaus and he fell in with them and they were telling him about what had happened in Jerusalem and he said, what happened in Jerusalem? He just wanted them to tell him. Oh, this man named Jesus was crucified and blah, blah, blah. And he said, what does the scripture say? Luke says, beginning at the beginning. He expounded, he explained to them all the things concerning the Christ, the Messiah. And after he left them that evening at supper, they said, did not our hearts burn within us when he explained scripture? Oral teaching. Paul did this while in Thessalonica and his three companions, or two companions, I mean, go back to the very first verse of this letter. Paul, Silvanus, or Silas, and Timothy. Those three. They worked with this church in Thessalonica. His companions helped him teach them what they needed to know. They did it orally. You say, well, did they have the Old Testament? They probably had some means of getting to it. But the Old Testament at that time was basically bound up in either the synagogue or the temple itself. But then Paul says, either by word, orally, or our epistle, by written letter. Who is this letter addressed to? To the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
If you looked on the outside, now he didn't write letters like we do, but if you looked on the outside of the letter, it would have said to the church of the Thessalonians. That's where the letter was supposed to go. Paul addresses this letter to the church. It is from him and his companions. Folks, and he warned the churches in the area of Galatia. If we or an angel from heaven should preach another gospel to you, let them be accursed. There's only one. Folks, you should thank God every day that we have both testaments. Not just one. Both of them. The complete Word of God. There are no other books that need to be in here. There are no other letters that need to be in here. There's nothing else that needs to be in here. Now, Martin Luther, and I had a great respect for Martin Luther here many, many, many years ago before I was ever born. He said that James was an epistle of straw. Well, I think if I could sit down, I would explain to him that it's not. We have the complete Word of God. It is often delivered to us orally, spoken. Now, what do we learn from this? Well, election is a cause for rejoicing. It's like you're in the orphanage and God walks by and says, I want him. I want her. And you didn't even know it. I didn't know it. I didn't know it till that time and time when the Holy Spirit revealed it. When he does, you get all kind of responses, don't you? Did you cry when you re first realized how bad of a sinner you were and how great Jesus was? It's really easy to do. Sometimes people rejoice. Sometimes they laugh and can't stop laughing because they realize, man, he chose me. We have been chosen by God to be a part of his forever family. He did this without our consent, and we ought to praise him for it. Not only for ourselves, but for others. I have to admit, folks, in my prayer time, I seldom pray, Lord, thank you for electing so-and-so. But he did. As the apostle did in this letter, we ought to praise God for his election of our brothers and sisters. Rather than run from biblical doctrine, we are to embrace it and do all we can to understand. There's much in Scripture that goes against our nature, isn't there? Please say yes. Because you, if, if you're here, that means at one time you were a child. And I know, I've asked children, I even asked them at camp, have you ever disobeyed your parents? I didn't have to ask the parents. I knew they had. There's much in Scripture that goes against our sinful nature. I pray that we will grasp things like election, doctrine, and come to love that which God gives us in His Word. And perhaps you don't know if God has elected you. I can tell you how you can know. Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. Come and watch what he does. He will not cast us out. He will not reject you. We have his word on that. Now, if you want to know more, if you can't do it today, I live two doors down. And my door might be locked, but if you come, I will open it up. And we'll talk about this. Because you need to know, and I'd like to know. Whatever you are led by the Spirit of God to do, I pray you'll do it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for your precious word. And Lord, sometimes it tells us things that we might not like. And most of the time that's because we don't understand it. There, it is true, there are folks in our society 
that do not understand, and, and they certainly don't understand how that you made male and female and nothing else. They don't understand that. They come up with all of these other names for what they think they are when it's one or the other. And Father, the bottom line is we have your word on that. Help us do what it says. Help us obey it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.